I'm going to talk to you about operative vaginal delivery. This is an outline of my presentation. I will provide an introduction to operative vaginal delivery, followed by the indications, contraindications, and prerequisites of this mode of delivery. This will be followed by a little about forceps and vacuum-assisted deliveries and their application and complications. Operative vaginal delivery involves the use of forceps or a vacuum device to assist the mother in childbirth. The goal of operative vaginal delivery is to mimic spontaneous vaginal birth and expedite delivery, and at the same time, minimizing maternal and neonatal morbidity. One should balance the risks and benefits of operative delivery when deciding on when to intervene during normal labor. In the US, about 4.5% of vaginal births are operative deliveries, with a high success rate of 99%. Vacuum-assisted births are at least four times more popular than forceps-assisted births. A retrospective study done in Singapore General Hospital, SGH, found that the rate of operative vaginal delivery was approximately 10% from 2012 to 2017. Here is a list of indications for operative vaginal delivery. However, one should also note that there are no absolute indications for operative vaginal delivery and that cesarean delivery is also an option in those settings. Operative vaginal delivery is attempted when the clinician believes success is likely. It is also preferred when further progress of labour appears unlikely. The indications of operative vaginal delivery can be broadly classified into fetal, maternal, and inadequate progress. Fetal indications include presumed fetal compromise or probable imminent fetal compromise, for example, when there is abnormal cardiotocograph findings. Maternal indications include to shorten and reduce the effects of the second stage of labor on the background of maternal medical conditions. An inadequate progress in labor would include a lack of continuing progress in labor over a stipulated period of time, as well as maternal fatigue or exhaustion. There are some contraindications to operative vaginal delivery, and these are mostly related to unacceptable fetal risks, such as suspected fetal pelvic disproportion, fetal bleeding disorders such as fetal hemophilia, which may result in a cephalohematoma or subdural hemorrhage, fetal predisposition to fractures such as osteogenesis imperfecta, fetal prematurity, which is especially true for vacuum extractors, first due to the risk of subdural and intracranial hemorrhage, increased chance of fetal abrasion or scalp trauma. Operative delivery is also contraindicated before full cervical dilatation or in the presence of an unengaged fetal head or when the fetal position is unknown. Vacuum extractors in particular are contraindicated when there is phase presentation and when there is prior scalp sampling or multiple attempts at fetal scalp electrode placement. Before performing an assisted vaginal delivery, ensure that the fetal head is at most one-fifth palpable, that the fetus is in vertex presentation, the cervix is fully dilated and the membranes have ruptured. Ensure that fetal presentation, position, lie, and any asyncretism are known. Assess the caput and molding of the fetus. And ensure that the maternal pelvis is deemed adequate and there is no cephalopelvic disproportion. Ensure that the mother has been prepared for the procedure by making sure that clear explanation has been given and informed consent has been obtained. Check that appropriate analgesia has been administered for mid-cavity rotational deliveries. Ensure that maternal bladder has been emptied recently and that the indwelling catheter has been removed or at least deflated. The operator should have the knowledge, experience and skill required to perform the delivery and the procedure should be performed aseptically. Adequate facilities should be prepared and made available. A backup plan should also be put in place in case of failure to deliver such as a crash cesarean delivery. The operator should anticipate complications that may arise during the procedure, such as shoulder dystocia and postpartum hemorrhage.
and be prepared to address these complications. In addition to this, someone who is trained in neonatal resuscitation should also be present. Here is a picture of the anatomy of the forceps. The key structures of the forceps are the blades, shank, lock, finger guards, and handle. The handles transmit the applied force. The screw or lock represent the fulcrum, and the blades transmit the load. The Keelan forceps are a type of rotational forceps. They possess a slightly backward pelvic curve with overlapping shanks and a sliding lock. It allows for rotation of the vertex without moving the handles of the forceps through a wide arch. The Neville Barnes forceps is a mid-cavity non-rotational forceps. It is used when the fetal head is one-fifth palpable per abdomen or when the leading point of the skull is above station plus two but not above the ischial spines. Rickley forceps is a low cavity forceps that is used when the fetal scalp is visible without separating the labia, or when the fetal skull has reached the pelvic floor, or when the fetal head is at or on the perineum. It can also be used during cesarean section. The vacuum extractor such as a kiwi cup works on the principle of creating negative pressure to allow fetal scalp tissues to be sucked into the vacuum cup. The kiwi cup can be applied to the flexion point in the occipital, lateral and posterior position. The forceps should grasp the occiput anterior fetal head and the long axis of the blades should correspond to the occipital mental diameter. The tips of the blades will lie over the cheeks and the blades will be equidistant from the sagittal suture. The posterior fontanelle should be one finger breadth anterior to the horizontal plane of the blades. Fenestrated blades should admit a maximum of one finger breadth between the heel of the fenestration and fetal head. Make sure that no maternal tissue is grasped. For the application of the vacuum extractor, determine the location of the flexion point and apply the cup at that position. The flexion point is normally located along the midline over the sagittal suture, approximately 6 cm from the anterior fontanelle and 3 cm from the posterior fontanelle. Ensure that the vacuum placement is correct on the flexion point. Sweep the edges with a finger to ensure that no maternal tissues are entrapped. Then rapidly apply a maximum suction of 600 mm of mercury. Apply gentle traction along the axis of the pelvic curve in synchrony with maternal pushing. Should the vacuum get dislodged from the fetal head, examine the fetal scalp to ensure there is no injury before the vacuum extractor is reapplied. Vacuum assistance should be limited to three contractions for the descent phase, three contractions for the outlet extraction phase, two to three pop-offs, and a total time of 15 to 30 minutes. Operative vaginal delivery can be abandoned when the following occurs. Firstly, the instrument cannot be applied. Secondly, descent of the fetus still does not occur even after traction has been applied. Thirdly, if the fetus has not been delivered after a period of time. When the procedure is abandoned, a caesarean section can be done instead. Complications of operative vaginal delivery can be broadly classified into maternal complications and fetal complications. Maternal complications can be short-term or long-term. Short-term maternal complications include maternal trauma, especially when rotational or mid-cavity forceps delivery were performed. It also includes pain, lower genital tract lacerations and hematomas, urinary retention and incontinence, anemia, anal incontinence, and rehospitalization. Long-term maternal complications are urinary or fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and fistula formation. Similarly, neonatal complications can be short-term or long-term. Short-term neonatal complications include subgaleal hematoma, intracranial hemorrhage, bruises, abrasions and lacerations, facial nerve palsy, cephalohematoma, retinal hemorrhage, scar fractures, hyperbilirubinemia, shoulder dystocia, brachial plexus injury, extraocular trauma, as well as lipoid necrosis.
Long-term neonatal complications are intracranial hemorrhage and neuromuscular injury. Quiz time. Question 1. Which of the following is not a contraindication to operative vaginal delivery? Question 2. A baby boy was born two hours ago via vacuum-assisted delivery. His parents are concerned about a fluctuant lump on the neonate's head. It does not cross suture lines. Otherwise, the rest of the neonatal examination was unremarkable. What is the most likely diagnosis? Question 3. Which of the following is not an indication for operative vaginal delivery? 